Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Brian Hennessy. Thanks for being on the show, Brian. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your uh, invitation. Brian has been in the commercial real estate industry for over 30 years as a commercial broker, a senior vice president of acquisitions and dispositions, and also ran his own real estate syndication asset management company. He's author of many well-known books. That's probably where you've heard his name. Um, He's author of Due Diligence Handbook for Commercial Real Estate, How to Add Value Handbook to Commercial Real Estate, the Residential Agents Handbook for Commercial Real Estate, and he also has, has a due diligence course for commercial real estate. He conducts seminars that teaches the principles in his books in greater detail for his audience. He, he shares his experiences, tragedies, tactics, and many lessons learned over the years as, his ac- as an acquisition executive, investor, and commercial real estate broker. Well, thank you again so much, Brian, for being on the show, and uh, give our listeners a little more about your background in case they haven't heard of you before. Uh, and tell us how you got into specifically the syndication business. Okay. Um, what happened was I've been in the uh, commercial end of the real estate industry, commercial real estate uh, as a broker and syndicator and acquisition person for uh, about 35 years. And what happened was after 18 years of being a commercial broker, I had a client of mine that uh, invited me over to become his um, senior vice president of uh, acquisitions and dispositions in a, uh, an investment firm that he had founded. And uh, I had sold him a couple of buildings and uh, he had worked on me coming over, but he was intent on growing this thing. And I had been a broker uh, for about 18 years. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that'd be kind of interesting being on that side of the business, being a buy buyer instead of a broker. And that's a natural slide. How much different can it be? Well, I found out it's very different than being a broker. And uh, once I got over there, I got involved with a couple of larger uh, office properties that he was buying from a Canadian investment firm. And I was dealing with his vice president of the uh, firm. And he quickly surmised that I was a neophyte when it came to uh, purchasing large office properties and proceeded to take me to school. And what turned out was a very stressful Uh, due diligence period where I had to keep track of all this information and uh, had like six legal pads on my desk and scribbling who, who did I ask what and who knew, who owes me what information and what else do I need to check out? And when is that person getting back with that answer? And as the due diligence period Uh, continued on and got closer to the end, the heat got turned up and I started getting calls from the uh, real estate attorney, the accountant, the lender, the investor, you know, and I was like, I couldn't wait for it to end. It was just laying awake at night trying to think about what else do I need to get. And uh, after the closing about two or three weeks later, I was coming into the office and, um, one of the people said, Hey, you know, the investor wants to, to talk to you in his office. I said, okay. So I went in there and he said, have a seat. And, uh, he got up and he closed the door. And after a long silence, I heard, um, I want to know how you missed all this information during the due diligence period on these properties. And I was like, which information? And he proceeded to go through some stuff, which, Quite frankly, I I remember asking for some of it. Some of it I didn't ask for, but, you know, as if I was supposed to know all this stuff and I I didn't, you know, and I, all I could say was, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize. And he said, I I think I made a huge mistake making you my head of acquisitions and dispositions. And I was 
I didn't know what to say. I just was humiliated and embarrassed and thinking maybe he was right. Maybe it was a wrong mistake. But then I, that night when I was, I went to bed, I was laying awake going, I, you know, how, how can I make this different? You know, there's no way I could have, should have missed that information. And I just finally decided I was going to create a reference book for myself that had all the questions to ask, the issues to review, the checklists. So I didn't have to reinvent the wheel every time we went and bought a property. And uh, every time we bought a, uh, another property and I learned a new lesson, I would put it in my little reference manual. And it continued to grow because we ended up uh, buying about 9 million, almost 9 million square feet um, during that period of time in about less than six years. I was all over the country. And we just had a small little group and it was just very intense uh, purchase and sales of properties all the time. And um, what happened was I ended up going off on my own and syndicating uh, five office buildings in Houston, about 350,000 square feet, which was a huge lesson um, because it, it was what was interesting to me is the investor, I would say, well, I know what you mean when you, and he goes, no, you're never going to know what I mean until you have your own properties and you have to lay awake at night and, and think about how you're going to make things work. And, you know, and I had a, a the, the time that I bought this thing was I, my timing probably couldn't have been worse. It was, I bought it in March of 2007 and um, I, I, I did a lot of uh, uh, value add stuff to it. I, I actually added about 700 grand in net operating income in the first 14, 16 months I, that we had them. But then the, the, when I put them back in the, on the market to go out is when the whole subprime market was starting to rear its ugly head out and uh, was making it very difficult to get it uh, sold or financed. So it was a huge lesson because my, my mortgage payment every month was $250,000 a month. So, you know, I had to <laughs> lay awake at some nights wondering, you know, how am I going to make this happen? But in uh, over it's about almost three and a half years that we had it, I never had a late payment. And um, it was just a very, very... Uh, super stressful time to be owning the property, but tons of lessons were learned. Nice. So, you know, Brian, I know you are the uh, due diligence expert, right? You know, I mean, you've written these books and, you know, I'd like for us to, to focus maybe the rest of our conversation mostly on due diligence and you, you helping us to better understand how to do do that part of the, of the business better. And uh, so, you know, would you get us started, you know, with, you know, how, how do we educate ourselves to know how to, how to better do the due diligence before we purchase a property? Sure. Um, interestingly enough, uh, it, well, obviously I can't teach you all I know in the little short time we're going to be talking here, but I can point you in some directions with some stuff, but, um, you know, what happened, what I found is most investors and uh, commercial brokers just don't know what they don't know just like I didn't when I got over there. And um, it's a matter of uh, educating yourself and getting yourself up to speed, which doesn't take very long, by the way. Once you start on that learning curve, it goes pretty quick. Yeah, but it's more of a, uh, a system that I put together. And uh, what happened was we ended up buying some very, uh, some big portfolios. We bought uh, a 1.8 million square foot portfolio from Sam Zell uh, of equity office properties, uh, four properties, four large office properties in Dallas. And then we bought a 2.2 million square foot portfolio from Transwestern uh, with four buildings in Chicago and three buildings in Dallas. And we had to do that 30 day due diligence, 30 day close. So you really have to be on your, game when you're uh, doing that type of due diligence because uh, what happens is these guys are pros, professional sellers, and 
if you're not on your game, I believe me, things will come back to haunt you and bite you later on. So you, you really need to know what you're looking for. I, I learned some of my biggest lessons from working with the, the uh, professional groups out there. So, uh, and I tell people, look, you know, you can't assume anything. It just, what happens is when you say, what kind of due diligence are you doing? Well, I, you know, I'll show up at the building when the contractor goes there and he inspects it. Okay. What else are you doing? Well, I do some market studies and I, you know, I get the brokers to come up with some stuff and okay, what else are you doing? And, you know, there's about a couple of three more things and then that's kind of it, you know, and it's like, Oh, there's you scratching the surface here. Okay. Because believe me, if you're not drilling down and pulling back all the layers here, there's some valuable things, uh, that you're, uh, leaving out. And it's very hard to do if you don't have a process and a system, because I tell people by having an adhering to a proven system, when you're doing due diligence, it allows you to do it faster, easier, more efficiently, and you're a lot less likely to miss something. So you want to be not stressed when you're going through this stuff because most people think about this. Most people are buying a, an investment property and there's a lot of things going on. You know, if you're a syndicator, well, you might have some help, right? You might have a few more people in your in your office helping you or whatever, helping you get it done. But if you're not, you're doing this like on the side while you're doing your job or whatever the case may be. Right. And you're, you've got to go through the due diligence, physical, mechanical. Uh, you got to go through the market stuff. You got to apply for the loan. You got to get the appraisal done. You got to negotiate with the seller. You got to, I mean, you, you know, there's all these things, talk to the tenants, all this stuff. So it's like, you really got to make sure that things aren't slipping through the cracks because what happens is if you're talking to a property manager or a seller and you say, I really need the backup information on that. Okay. I'm going to get that for you. When are you going to have it for me? I'm going to have it by Thursday. Okay. You write that down or whatever. All right. Well then what happens? Four more, five more things come up in the next day or so that you need to get answers on right now some of these are taking priority over the last thing you asked for so now you're worried about getting that stuff and if you don't have a tracking system what happens things start falling through the crack right or you might get back to it and say hey i thought you were going to get me that thing on thursday that's right i promise you i'll have that up to you on tuesday i did ask they're looking it up and you know and what happens that happens all the way down through the period till you get to the end now you got 19 or 28 things or whatever on your list that you're looking for to get uh, uh, answers to. And in the meantime, the heat's been turned up because you want to make sure you get your loan approved. You want to make sure the appraisal's going through, you know, you're, it, there's a, just too many things going on. So you really need a system and a process to go through that. And that's what I ended up putting together for myself because it just got to the point. We just had a little team and it was very stressful. So uh, I wanted to make sure that I, I knew I had a, a to-do list and, and a system that went through. So I knew what my next uh, thing that I had to get done and delegate. Okay, I need you to go do this or whatever. And then that's how I came up with it. Then by accident, really, it I uh, when I got back into the brokerage end of it in 2012, uh, I decided I was going to take the reference manual I have and morph it into a uh, investor handbook. And that's how it, things got started. I never thought it was it so one copy, so I didn't even get it formatted or anything. And then it ended up uh, becoming a number one bestseller on Amazon. Can, can you give us some tips on some type of tracking system that we can put in place Ab while we're going through due Ab diligence? Ab absolutely. I tell everybody, do everything through email, everything, even after the phone call with the property manager, seller, broker, whatever it is. Oh, you're going to get me that. Thanks very much. So it's Tuesday. Great. Hang up the phone. You send them an email as per our conversation. We, you're going to get me the, the backup information on the paid tenant improvements or whatever the case may be, right? The, the paid commission amount, the clearance, the lien releases on the 
you know, whatever the, whatever mechanics liens, whatever it is that, that you're looking for. And now you have a tracking system, right? And so what happens is you can go back as you start uh, getting closer to the end, you start reviewing all your, your emails and say, wait a minute, we never got a, and make sure that you're putting out all of your team members CC'd on it too, because everybody's, you know, you want everybody on the same page, right? And then uh, what happens, you're getting towards the end, you're going through and say, wait a minute, we never got this. We never got that. So I'll give you an example. Okay. We're buying an office building. We were supposed to get a uh, backup on paid commissions and tenant improvements that the contractor had done and that they were paid. And yes, we're going to get that for you. And a couple of days before I said, I never got the backup. You kept promising me uh, uh, for the $45,000 in tenant improvement work. And if we don't get the canceled checks, then we're going to expect the credit at the close of escrow. Well, all of a sudden now it's, you know, the real truth comes out. It's like, well, we have a dispute with that contractor. Well, you do. Okay. Well, either you clear it up or we're getting the credit one or the other. And, uh, miraculously these things get cleared up, you know, or they, or you end up getting the credit. But if you, if you don't know about them, they're hoping you forget all about them. So once you, once you close, it's very difficult to go back and get, get your money from them. But, I tell people, worst case scenario is you got some paper trails that you can show to the judge and say, your honor, I asked them four different times for this. They never gave it to us. And uh, fortunately, you know, hopefully you'll never have to get to that point. But that's the whole idea of doing the due diligence probably the first time. If you do now, they're motivated to get it closed. They're nice. going to get it cleared right. up. Right. So tell us, you know, a couple of the biggest issues you see during due diligence that that maybe newer investors or, or people make. Um, new, newer ones have a tendency to assume that they're going to be able to get the loan they think they're going to get on the property and, uh, they don't check with lenders ahead of time. They just kind of get into it and then find out, well, whoa, I, you know, why are you holding back reserves on that? And, you know, that, that type of stuff. So it's important. Sometimes you're not going to know some of this stuff till later, but I would tell don't be afraid to at least float it by some lenders and find out to get a soft quote on it. Yeah. Yeah. We lend on that kind of property and this is what you can expect. And uh, especially if there's, you know, some hair on the deal, you know, there's issues, you know, environmental or a lot of vacancy, uh, any number of things could be right. You want to make sure you bring that up because they say, Oh yeah, no, we're going to hold back, you know, a bunch of reserves on that because uh, you know, we, we normally don't lend on those type of deals or something. So that's, that's one mistake, not understanding the, the underwriting, uh, not going down to the city. A lot of people, I don't know why they don't do that. They go down to see if it complies with the municipal codes or any violations going on, any planned compliance issues that the property is going to have to comply with. Um, myriad of things that you can find out through that. And uh, yeah, I'm always amazed that people say, I had no idea that when I was going to make those improvements, they were going to make me do all the uh handicap upgrades and you know that's going to cost me a lot of money you, know? you would have known that had you gone down there so you got to plug that into your utter underwriting the other thing i was amazed about is the people don't the underwriting is not something you do once when you buy the property and then you know you hope it all works out it's something you're adjusting as you're going through your due diligence period whoa i didn't know that okay this per this tenant that I spoke to said they're probably going to vacate. So I got to plug in some downtime TIs, commissions, whatever. Right. These types of things uh, need to be accounted for because I always tell people, this is the crux. This is the absolute crux of uh, real estate investing. Okay. You rarely is the property worth the same as the accepted offer price that it is, uh, at the end of the due diligence period, once you've had a chance to go through and find out all the issues and the problems and the costs and expenses that you're going to have to deal with. And I tell people, you want to know this stuff because you want to be able to, the, the, the seller's not coming to you with a list of, you know, here are all the issues 
with the property that you need to be aware of. There's a lot of problems here. So I hope you, you know, make yourself aware of them. No, they hope, they hope you don't find any of them. Right. So when you get to the end, you go, wait a second. Whoa. I did, you know, I never knew this tenant was going to vacate. Hey, I'd never knew this, you know, this wall, you know, the building hasn't, hasn't been wet sealed and, you know, uh, you know, 12 years and now all the windows are leaking and that the HVAC units are at the end of their useful lives and that the elevator needs or elevators need uh, modernizing and the roof has got about five more years and it's going to have to be replaced. All these things you got to factor in. Now, obviously you don't have to do all of them necessarily, you know, when you close escrow, but you better be aware of them. It's going to impact your cash flow. Right. All right. And, so and you want to be able to go back to the seller and say, Hey, you know what? I don't expect you to credit me for, uh, you know, all these things, but I, I am going to expect a, a discount of X amount. Uh, if I'm going to be able to go non-refundable with my money and uh, proceed with getting this thing done. All right. So, so changing gears just a little bit, Brian, um, you know, someone that comes to you and says, I really want to get into the syndication business. You know, what, what's some advice you tell them? What's some key things that they need to do? Well, <laughs> I would say um, you've, you've got to be um, diligent, patient. Uh, if it's your first deal, don't give up. Um, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, it, it's going to be um, difficult generally speaking, to get the first investors in if it's your first deal. But if they believe in you, you'll get people um, coming in and, and cutting you a check and say, hey, you know what? That sounds like a, a good deal to me. I think I'll go. Once you have the first few people investing, it's easier to get the rest. Nobody likes to be the first one necessarily to, to cut the check. But um, uh, I tell people, look, I my story of buying those five office, but that was my first deal that I syndicated myself. It was a uh, $25 million deal. And uh, I was in the office till late at night trying to get people to invest with me. And they knew that I knew what I was doing, but it was difficult. It was like your first deal you're, you're doing this. And, you know, so it was like, finally I got the first, few guys that put up the money then all of a sudden it just started coming and to the point where I had to tell people no I'm sorry I'm fully subscribed you, you can be in on the next one I can't can't take any more investors for this one and um, then then it's it's kind of like a fire rights passage which you could probably relate to right sure sure no, that's, yeah. that's some great advice and you know tell us the the one the number one thing that's contributed to your success uh, well, I would say uh, the number one thing that has contributed to my success is uh, my faith. You know, mm. I've got very strong faith muscles that I've had to exercise. <laughs> and uh, I tell people, you, you need to exercise your faith and courage muscles if you're going to be in this business. It just, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, you're going to get a ton of tests. Um, you're going to fail. And you're going to succeed, but they are interrelated. So don't be afraid to fail. That's how people learn. We're, we're um, built that way, right? So uh, I, it's only failure if you don't learn from it. Hmm. And um, there are lots of lessons to learn. But what happens is if you do that, you get stronger and uh, smarter and people actually uh, appreciate the fact that you've been through some difficulties and you're able to weather it. And I think that, you know, that's why it's the kind of the mantra up in the tech world is, you know, they, they ask you how many times you failed because that's a, that's a indication of how much, uh, persistence you've had and how hard you try. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, there's a lot of people that, um, 
say they want to do it, but saying you want to do it and getting into action and doing it are two different things. And uh, I always tell people, keep learning, never stop learning. Just there's always something to learn. I've been doing this for 35 years. I still learn stuff about this stuff. And I'm like, you know, I, every time I think I've known, I've seen it all, something new comes up, you know, and the world's changing fast too. So um, um, that's what I, that's what I would say for getting started in the syndication. Nice. Business. Nice. So Brian, you've, you've been a fantastic guest. You know, would you tell our listeners how they can learn more about you and your company and your books? Absolutely. Um, but one more thing I want to say in regards to that though, is it's all people say, well, what do you, what's the main thing I should be focusing on? And I say, it's, it's your compass should be love and service. That's mm -hmm. what it's about. You know, all the great masters, saints and sages, throughout time, I've always said, it's all about love and it's all about service. And if you're doing that, then there's no way that God's going to let you fail. Okay. You're just going to, you're going to do fine, but, but that's got to be your compass. Um, in terms of uh, getting a hold of me uh, and you want to learn more about due diligence, which I highly recommend you do because I call it failure proofing yourself uh, when it comes to uh, investing in real estate because um, there's just way too many uh, variables to go uh, leave un unleft that you know if you if you do you're gonna you're just something's gonna come back to haunt you and it's not about hey you know buy it and eventually it's gonna go up it's much more real estate's much more complex today than it, in it than it has been when I first got into business, people think, Oh, it's simple. Just buy and it's going to go up. And no, it, there's a lot of other variables. We've just been through a very unique cycle with the low interest rates that I've never seen, by the way, in my career, I never dreamed they, they were going to be this low. So don't think that they can never go up again because they do. I've actually seen them go up to 18 and 20% in my career. Wow. So, um, and when I first got into the business, they were like nine, 10%. So um, you have to be aware of this stuff. It does change all the time and it's all cyclical. So don't think it just will forever keep going up and nothing's ever going to change because that's right. I've heard it way too many times, but um, go to uh, uh, impact coaching systems dot com that's with uh, an s impact coaching systems.com and if you do uh, forward slash courses you can uh, get access to my course I, I told Whitney that I would offer a 25 percent discount uh, to his listeners and if you put in the code ws25 as in Whitney Sewell 25 um, you will get a 25% discount off the course price. And in it, I teach the deep dive principles of due diligence. And you've got 30 days. If you don't think it's worth at least, I, I tell people, if you don't think it's worth at least 10 times what you paid for it, uh, then just send me an email. I'll refund your money. No problem. No questions asked. Um, I think personally, you'll think it's worth a hundred times when you get through because you'll see the value that it has. It, but it's more than that. You, you end up being a much more confident uh, investor uh, and competent because now you've got this knowledge. And when you're talking to brokers and sellers and you're talking the way you, you're talking from the standpoint of having this knowledge foundation, they, they, you sound like uh, you've been doing it your whole life and they're less likely to play games with you. So I highly recommend it. Anyway, uh, go to uh, uh, impactcoachingsystems.com. I've got free resources there that you can access forms and what have you, you can use in your investing business. Uh, my, my books, uh, the due diligence handbook for commercial real estate, uh, the how to add value handbook for commercial real estate. My other book is going to be out in the next probably 30 days, 45 days. And that's the resident, residential agents handbook for commercial real estate. So uh, I want to thank you again, Whitney, for inviting me on. I really enjoyed yeah, thank uh, you, Brian. being on here. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I hope the listeners will connect with Brian and I hope you'll check out his video courses. Don't forget the code WS25 so you can get the 25% discount. 
And uh, I hope you'll go to lifebridgecapital.com and schedule a call with me so I can help you any way that I can. And also join us on the Facebook group so we can all learn and grow our business together and, and ask uh, experts like Brian these questions about due diligence and different aspects that, that uh, we need to learn more about. So we'll talk to each of you tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Whitney. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.